Um, hello everyone. My name is Gilbert Farwind, and I'm here to improve Westeros. I'd like to introduce new legislation to end feudalism and establish a central government. Leaders will be elected with strict term limits, and there will be equal protection under the law, regardless of race, gender, religion, or sexual preference. I'm even thinking about a comprehensive health care plan. Boo, foreigner. You will never be my king. What? I was actually born in Westeros. As I was saying, I was thinking about introducing paper currency. Where is your birth certificate, Gilbert Farwind? Those aren't actually a thing in Westeros. Now, as I was saying, this would allow monetary policy- Whatever, crooked Gilbert. Boo! And I'd really like to talk about the idea of trials by jury replacing trials by battle. Why did you have your maester burn your raven messages? <sighs> Fuck it. Krakaris. And so our episode begins with... Oh god, are we really... This is how we're starting out? I guess so. Our episode begins with Braun hauling a fully armor-clad Jamie out of a river well away from the eyes of Daenerys. I guess Tyrion is covering for them because he totally saw them. Ugh. Chad, you're a strong swimmer. How far do you think you can go holding your breath? Oh, dude, I am awesome. I can swim like 75 meters. So like the length of Danny's dragon. Just just checking on that. I mean, that's how far I can swim if I'm naked. If I'm wearing clothes, it's like half that. And what about armor? We just saw the armor pulling Jamie to the bottom last episode and suddenly it's light as a feather. What's his armor made of, aluminum? Aluminum's only 40% as light as steel. He must be wearing some carbon fiber or something. How much does plot armor weigh? And next we have the most moral man in the universe lamenting all of this death for the first time. Do you think he did the same thing over the bodies of the Sons of the Harpy? Well, they weren't Lannisters. The most moral man in the universe feels tribalism, apparently. And then we have Danny trying very hard not to kill the Tarleys, but the Tarleys are rather insistent. Randall criticizes Tyrion for killing his father, which is pretty rich coming from a man who threatened to kill his son on a hunt. Anyway, it turns out that Randall's irrational hatred for expats surpasses even that of his irrational hatred for wildlings. Shunning kneeling and the wall, he chooses death, as does his 32-year-old boy son. Channeling Barristan circa season 4, Tyrion pleads for House Tarly's lives, but Daenerys refuses, citing imprisonment as a problem. Next, we have a scene with Cersei because, you know, we paid a lot of money for Lena Headey and we're gonna use her, damn it. We need to have at least one person who's not phoning it in. Anyway, Jamie breaks the news that actually Olena killed Joffrey, and he proposes that they sue for peace. Cersei concludes that they're fucked six ways from Sunday, so they might as well just keep on fighting. Meanwhile, Danny returns to Dragonstone with her hair and makeup looking like this. Wasn't she just in a battle? Anyway, we find out that Kit Harrington has a lot more sexual chemistry with a CGI dragon than he does with Amelia Clark. Anyway, Danny finally decides to ask about Kit Harrington's resurrection, a conversation she could have had at any time during the many weeks that Jon has been on Dragonstone, but lo and behold, she happens to have it now so she can be interrupted by Jorah's return. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. How did the Dothraki get back so quickly? Do their ships go as fast as dragons fly? Man, this teleportation is just ridiculous. Well, anyway, because the fans demanded it, we have even more of Danny and Jorah. I think the torture of Jorah Mormont is really rivaling that of Theon. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Jorah is far more neutered. Anyway, Jorah senses the overwhelming sexual chemistry and immediately catches on to the fact that Danny is more into Kit Harrington than she is into Jorah. Well, to be honest, you just have to be any other man besides Jorah to have a shot with Danny. Well, Danny has some standards, but eunuchs, dwarves, and Jorahs need not apply. By the way, is no one gonna mention Longclaw? Your family sword is right there, Jorah. I guess it has a new hilt and he doesn't recognize it. Next, the Brand 9000 decides to tap into some ravens and goes to bother the Night King on his Sunday stroll. The Night King then shoes away Bird Bran, thinking kids these days have no respect for elders. The Bran 9000 then decides to let everyone know about the army beyond the wall, as if the Night's Watch hasn't been trying this for the past six seasons. Down at the Citadel, the Maesters receive Bran's letter, and Sam attempts to sound the alarm again. But quite reasonably, the Maesters want to collect more information. Sam marches off in a huff, and we find out that there could have been a really interesting scene where Sam finds out that his father and brother died, but... Phew, thank goodness the show spared us from that. 
Meanwhile, back on Dragonstone, Tyrion is teleported back and is drinking with Varys. The two talk about how their queen is not so inspirational anymore and is now kind of a loose cannon, but that she will do fine as long as she has the right advisors. I'm not sure why Varys didn't just do this with Robert in the first place rather than conspiring against him to put Viserys on the throne. Was the peace and prosperity under Robert and John Arryn really that bad? Anyway, then Kit Harrington reads the letter and finds out that his sister and brother are alive. Again, John says that he needs to go home to defend the wall and wants Danny to help him. Danny says she can't because the minute she marches away, Cersei will march in. What the hell is Danny talking about? March in where? The sum of Danny's conquests are Dragonstone and Casterly Rock. You know, there's just, you know, war going on. That's all you have to worry about. Anyway, Tyrion then channels Season 1 Geor Mormont and decides that they need a specimen to prove to Cersei that the Whites are real. If only they hadn't dropped that plot. Meanwhile up north, the Northern and Vale Lords realized that Season 6 was a piece of crap. They realized they should have named Sandra Queen in the North. Yeah, no shit. Sandra then says she saw this coming. The North wouldn't just wait for Kit Harrington like Ghost. Like who? I don't know, someone named Ghost? Huh, who's that? I have no idea, it doesn't ring a bell. Anyway, next we spin Arya's personality wheel and it lands on Maniac. She decides that Sander is being materialistic because she took her parents' bedroom, is trying to usurp John, and should be beheading people. Man, these stark reunions are so heartwarming. Anyway, next the master smuggler Davos rows the most wanted man in the Seven Kingdoms onto the beaches of King's Landing in broad daylight. Oh why hello, Shade of the Lamp. I just wanted to point out that they mentioned how Tyrion killed Davos' son, and now that issue is resolved. And then Bronn brings Jaime down to the basement so he can talk to Tyrion. When it comes down to it, I don't even know how to process this scene because it makes no sense. How did it happen, and why was it necessary? How on earth did Tyrion even contact Bronn? Did he send another smuggler on a different rowboat before Tyrion's rowboat, who contacted Bronn and then went back to Dragonstone to relay the message? Why does Tyrion even need to meet Jaime in the first place? Couldn't he have contacted Bronn to just relay the message back? And wouldn't it have been better for Jaime to travel to a neutral location? I know that Tyrion said that Jaime would never agree to meet him, but that seems like a bunch of bull. Sneaking into King's Landing seems outrageously dangerous and superfluous on Tyrion's part. What if Bronn betrays him? What if Jaime decided to kill him? And later we find out that Cersei knows the meeting is taking place. So Tyrion could have easily just been picked up and killed by Cersei. Keep in mind, the whole point of the meeting is for an armistice. The Lannisters are currently losing the war badly. Of course they're going to agree to this. There's actually little reason for there to be an emissary, and there's no reason for Tyrion to be that emissary. Anyway, for no reason at all, Davos decides to go recruit Gendry, who is smithing in Flea Bottom for no reason at all, and who has not been picked up by the Gold Cloaks for no reason at all. Yeah, I know Shade of the Lamp. I don't want to hear it. Anyway, Gendry all of a sudden really loves his dad for no reason at all, and then wants to join Davos' fight for no reason at all. He even has a friggin' go-bag. The thing about Gendry, though, a character not seen for several seasons, plus non-essential with a yet unresolved plotline? Gendry is totally toast. And then we get some crazy hijinks as Davos and Gendry decide to bribe some guards with 30 friggin' gold dragons. Which seems to work until more hijinks, cause Tyrion arrives. Comedy ensues, until two men are brutally murdered. Anyway, next Jaime goes to see Cersei about his Tyrion meeting, which Cersei already knew about and is totally on board with the armistice. So the queen, who actually has all of the power, came to this decision without meeting with anyone. Again showing that Tyrion's smuggling adventure was pointless. Cersei then reveals that she's pregnant and is happy to announce to everyone that Jaime is the father. Because when you're horribly losing a war and known for regicide, mass murder, and sacrilege, the best thing to do is to flaunt incest. Anyway, next Gendry and Kit Harrington meet and they proceed to jerk each other off. And they make sure the audience really, really, really notices the parallel between Ned and Robert and them. And then we're forced to watch a bunch of touching goodbyes. Tyrion and Jorah say goodbye, misty-eyed after spending a whopping three episodes together in season five. And then we get the fourth departure of Jorah from Danny. Oh, the fourth time is the charm. And we know it's touching because this ad telling me to go to GameOfThrones.com tells me it's touching. It's not at all, you know, creepy, sad, or pathetic. Some guy worshipping some random woman 30 years his junior that constantly rejects him because she happens to look like his ex-wife. Nope, totally touching. But nothing is more electric than the goodbye between Kit Harrington and Danny. 
Look at the passion in her eyes. And you know the love is strong because they looked at cave drawings together. Meanwhile in Old Town, Gilly is reading about a high septon with a name. A high septon with a name. And he annulled Rhaegar's marriage. Annulled. One that was already consummated. One with children. My god. Just a few episodes ago, Tyrion made a big deal about how his marriage to Sandra didn't count because it wasn't consummated, even though the High Septon made the marriage. So consummation was more important than the High Septon's opinion. But now we just have some random named High Septon who can just annul a marriage, essentially transforming Rhaegar's living children into bastards. Keep in mind in our world, annulment historically is no easy thing. King Henry VIII requested one and was denied with regards to his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. This was a really, really big deal and caused England's split from the Catholic Church. But whatever, anything to make Kit Harrington into even more of a super special snowflake. He's got his wolf spirit animal and can ride dragons and come back from the dead and is so good at sword fighting and it's got a magical sword. He's the Lord Commander, he's the King of the Wildlings, he's the King in the North. He's Azor Ahai and the prince that was promised and Jesus and he's got a three foot dick. Why have a character have any interesting flaws at all? After all, we can just retcon everything with High Septon Maynard in a secret ceremony in Dorne. Maybe High Septon Maynard can help us unfuck this plot. And why won't you age? Age, baby, age. Anyway, Sam then chooses this very moment to steal some random books and then leave the Citadel forever. You don't want to get some sleep first before that long journey? This seems like a pretty dumb idea. Sam already proved himself useful to the cause by being at the Citadel. He located the Dragonglass stash. And he already said earlier in the episode that what he really needed was more researchers. I fail to see how running away helps anybody. Anyway, Arya then once again proves herself to be the worst faceless man on the planet by blatantly spying on Littlefinger. And then Littlefinger seems to plant Sandra's old letter that she wrote under duress for Arya to find, making it look like Sandra is trying to cover something up. And although it would be absolutely epic for Littlefinger to successfully outplay Arya and get her killed, I think we all know the opposite will happen, and it will be lame. And finally, we have a bunch of random badass characters with contrived motivations up at Eastwatch. Jorah is there, I suppose, to impress Danny. He hasn't given any other reason. Beric, Thoros, and the Hound because of an inexplicable vision, aka the plot demands it. And Gendry just because. Kit Harrington and Tormund are really the only ones with reasons to be there. And even Tormund was originally trying to run from the White Walkers. Ah well, this whole mission seems to be designed to kill off characters. Man, what are we getting back to the North? I'm sure the Northern Lords are missing their queen. We aren't going to the North. We're on a quest to Cracklaw Point to deal with the real threat. Real threat? What are you talking about? This war between you, g Queen, and Gilbert Farwind is a distraction. The real threat lurks below. The real threat is the Squisher King. And so I've assembled a dream team to collect a Squisher. What makes you think we can all work together? Because we all have lungs. 